Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. All right, man, you're the reason we're 40 minutes behind, so you're opening. Whoops. Yeah, that's my bad. I was supposed to be done on time, and that's why I was good with 9 p.m., but when they say they're serving dinner at 6 and it doesn't start till 7.30, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's all their fault. It's a tough life being part of a uh, golf club. Is that what you guys call it, golf club? Um, Yeah, I think so. I don't I've never really... Uh, I play at a golf, yeah, I guess a golf club. We'll go with that. Huh. It, I love tracking reasons we're all late for this podcast, because anytime I'm I'm late getting on, it's usually because I got stuck at work or one of the kids is sick or throwing a temper tantrum or some bullshit like that. If Ryan's late, it's because someone at work uh, did something incredibly stupid and he's screwed or he just had an existential crisis and cried in the corner for 30 minutes leading up to the episode. Meanwhile, Evan had a catered dinner and won $100 and we're 40 minutes late because of it. <laughs> it was yeah. a tough night, let me tell you. <laughs> that pumpkin tomato soup was unreal, though. Let right. me tell you. S- swear to God, if you don't transfer Brad and I 20 bucks each right now when the episode's over. <laughs> the roasted chickpeas really made it. Yeah, it was uh, unreal. Forget the twenty dollars. Transfer me some of the soup. I'll take it at this point. <laughs> I would take the soup over twenty bucks too. Can you Venmo soup? Is that a thing? I don't think so. Technology but we can figure will be something there. Out. Technology will be there soon enough. Oh man, we need the draft like yesterday. We are <laughs> app. We're losing it. <laughs> yeah, it's been one of those weeks. Uh, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. At the mercy of Evan's luxurious life, I'm Ryan Hanna. I'm a shadow of anything that resembles a member of high society. And I am $100 richer, Evan. Yeah, but you could have had $2,000 of golf clubs. I like golf clubs like the sticks, bucks. not the memberships. Someone really should have figured that out before they named the club in the club, right? Yeah. Yeah, there were some unreal prizes tonight. I probably walked home with one of the lamest prizes. I mean, I do like 100 bucks. But when you see four thousand and a two thousand uh, dollar fitting package and uh, five hundred dollar putter, I mean, one guy won a camo bag, golf bag, which is hideous, and they couldn't sell it, so that's why they were giving it away. I mean, a hundred bucks is a hundred bucks. When we in the later times, when we have meetups again in person, however far away that is, every one of you who goes there is, I give you a license to assault Evan. <laughs> That's it. Like, if you're mad at rich people, hit Evan. I want you to do it. Eat the rich. Yeah. The 1%. <laughs> and the 1% Evan. is 33% of this podcast. Yeah. Uh, man. Well, I'm going to redirect us to a slightly less rich sport in hockey. Um, on this episode of the podcast, we'll be talking about hockey. Uh, the NHL playoffs have advanced. Uh, there have been uh, trades. There have been signings. And we're going to be talking more about salary cap stuff and just whatever happens off the cuff. Um, bringing up, I don't know, whatever whatever comes to light. We're doing this podcast episode a day earlier than anticipated just because of scheduling issues, which is kind of remarkable that we have those in a pandemic. Uh, and then we'll be doing today's prospect profile, which is Quinton Byfield, which will be an exciting one. Um, and then we will head into overtime. So whenever we post like a thread or... Uh, let people know that we're recording an episode last minute. And that's like, we don't give them eight hours notice in my mind. I'm like, I, I feel bad. I didn't give people a chance to post an overtime. So I put the post up today and I put the tweet out and I even messaged on our uh, Winged Wheel podcast discord. For those of you who don't know, all of our patrons have access to the um, Winged Wheel podcast discord. It's a lot of fun in there. And uh, I messaged everyone and I tagged everyone, which is more, you know, everyone who participates in it. And, uh, <laughs> the overtime comments went up to like 30 right away. I was like, oh, yeah, well, I don't feel bad anymore. You guys are in there. You should feel bad. Now I'm mad at you. That, well, that's fine. Hey, people have questions, Brad. They have questions. You. I rarely have answers. And by the time we get to overtime, it'll be 11 p.m. People like your answers. So, 
you want to become less compelling, then maybe Evan will talk more. Why? They don't, they don't like Ryan's, so I've learned today. <laughs> How have people not figured out my secret yet, or our secret, really? Oh, that that we're just uh, bullshit in a skin suit? Yeah, we're not smart. No. We, we pretend not- we are, and, we, and what we say, we say with conviction. So it sounds like we know what we're talking about. We are actually just two hired actors that Evan, pay, Evan paid because he couldn't find people who would t- do most of the talking on his podcast. See, this would be believable, but you dumbed it down. Actors are cheap. Evan can do whatever he wants with those m- loads of money. It would have been more believable if you said we were Tupac-style holograms. I played How the fifth. not? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm trying to find like a, a a Tupac hologram joke in here to transition, but I honestly am not funny enough to do that. Stanley Cup Finals. We have one team in, and as everyone expected, the Dallas Stars. Okay, I'm gonna stop you right there because I have seen this constant story of the the upstart underdog Dallas Stars made it to the Stanley Cup final the great story of the west like they were one of the round robin teams they they did not have to play in the qualifying round they were one of the four best teams in the western conference this year it's not that crazy of a thing that they made the Stanley Cup finals they were one of the best teams in the league all year this isn't new the fact they're doing it with their backup goalie is a little new, but he's also been a really good goalie for a few years. I mean, if you had told me they were getting to the Stanley Cup Finals with Anton Kudobin and Tyler Sagan recording eight points in 20 games, now I would be a little more surprised. But Dallas themselves getting there isn't that crazy. This isn't the Islanders. This isn't if Calgary went on a run or one of the play-in teams went on a run. It was one of the top four teams in the conference, and I think they're by the round robin, their seating was third or something like that. We're not the more notable thing for me was who they went through, though, right? Like Colorado and Vegas are probably the two toughest opponents. Yeah. To pull in the West. Yeah, they did knock off. Yeah, probably the two top teams, two favorites in the West. That is surprising. Mind you, Colorado was devastatingly injured and Vegas couldn't score a goal to save their lives. But that's mainly because of Dallas. So still good for them. A lot of like uh, bad puck luck, a lot of bad bounces for Vegas. But at the end of the day, that's what the playoffs are about. Like, if it's if you're out playing them and the puck's not going in, you need to do something to make it work. And that sounds like bullshit coach speak mumbo jumbo, but legitimately, that's the difference maker in the playoffs. Hockey's random, not in that you get you close your eyes and something random happens. It's just like stuff like that, like a, a fourth liner, like a Luke Glendenny will come out there, have a career night or just an abdicator. It was his, it was game one against Pittsburgh in 09. Was it where he had two goals? I think so. Something like that happens. And all of a sudden your team stole a win where they shouldn't have. So yeah, Dallas found a way to do that uh, uh, up to the playoffs in this point. And Vegas couldn't in, uh, in that series. And man, Kivaranta involved again in that miraculous comeback. Because he tied it with, what, a few minutes left? Yep. He's, uh, I think, the second player in NHL history to... There was something with about scoring the tying goal with less than five minutes left in back-to-back series clinching games. or Some crazy stat like that. He's the new Justin Williams. Justin Williams, obviously known as Mr. Game 7 for how clutch he's he was over his career or is. I don't know if he's re-retired. But, yeah, that's going to be following him for the rest of his career. Good for him. Is he, like, has he played games, or is he, what, is he like, a Darren Helm-style rookie where he's starting more or less in the playoffs? No, he played. He was um, an undrafted free agent out of Finland. I guess he had a really good world championship and a good year in Finland last year, so a few teams were hot to trot on him and he ended up signing with Dallas. He wasn't an impact player by any means throughout the regular season, but he played and then yeah, this came out of nowhere. So the NHL is probably desperately hoping right now that it's Tampa Bay Dallas in there just because Tampa Bay is a little bit easier to to sell on TV. But the Islanders are a better market though. Are they? New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you yeah, no, you New you're York right on a that. billboard, on a commercial, whatever you want. Tampa Bay, they have the most boring jerseys in the league, and they're 
in the COVID capital of the world at the moment. So not exactly the easiest sell. But from a hockey entertainment standpoint, you want Tampa because could you imagine how boring Dallas and the Islanders would be? Relative to other things, I know hockey's not boring. And when I sit, call the Islanders or any team like that boring, people jump all over me. I'm just saying you got two defensive specialist teams going against each other in the cup final. There, there's better options. That's all I'm saying. I was going to say I would love to see Ben Bishop versus old team, but he won't even be playing. So that that won't even happen. That's not really. Because Dallas is not going home. No, I that was hysterical. I didn't know he had such an aggressive Russian accent. Oh, it it was mad. Have you seen Anton Kudobin? If anybody was going to have an aggressive Russian accent, it was him. Isn't he Kazakhstanian? Same difference? I don't know. Would it be Kazakhstani? What is that? Kazakh. Kazakh. Kazakhstan demonym. The greatest nation in the world. Number Apparently one order of potassium. Aren't didn't I read something too that they finished filming Borat too? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Is this related? Oh. Most likely. <laughs> I, I just want to say explanation. We were on track until Evan chimed in. So Evan, that's what you bring to the table. Borat too. Hot hitting analysis. Um. So Tampa Bay, the Islanders, that's a 3-2 series, right? The Islanders haven't tied it. They just brought it to within one. Correct. Yeah. And that was double overtime last game. Yeah, that's what it was. It was a 2-1 double overtime win. Man, there have been a lot of fun, unpredictable outcomes. Like, I'm having fun watching any random game in the playoffs at this point. It's silly season. It's amazing. It's pandemic hockey in a bubble with players who are tired playing every other day. It's it's awesome. We got to enjoy it. Yeah. No, it's it's we kind of predicted this. We're like it's going to be some bullshit like random teams that no one's expecting is going to make it through and it's going to be a lot of fun because they're going to still deserve it. I don't believe in like the asterisk, but it's going to be absolutely wacky. And like you said, Dallas isn't some chump team like they're a good team. And in normal playoffs, it wouldn't be unreasonable for Dallas to make it this far. But still, it's been a lot of fun. Um, okay. Outside of the actual playoffs, there was a trade today. A couple hours before. And a uh, little weird. It was a one-for-one trade. So uh, Minnesota, Bill Guerin, the new GM in Minnesota, trading with Buffalo. Uh, I can't even remember Buffalo's new GM's name. Something. Kevin Adams. Yeah. And uh, Marcus uh, Johansson went to Minnesota, his four and a half million dollar contract in exchange for Eric Stahl and his three point two five million dollar contract. Look, I'm not going to say the like burn the world down and this is, you know, the most earth shattering trade in the world. But I don't really get this one from Minnesota standpoint. This is the most Minnesota trade of all time. Or just a classic Minnesota trade. So, yeah, so this is where it's weird to me. Normally, when I see a trade like this, my me- my immediate thought is, okay, what's the cap? Someone's got like three years left or infinity more dollars. Marcus Johansson has one year left at 4.5. Eric Stahl has one year left at 3.2. I don't get it. They're, Marcus Johansson's four years younger, sure. But he's, they both only have one year left on their deals. And by and large, um, Eric Stahl has been far more productive in his 30s than Johansson's been in the years leading up to it. So I, I can't make heads or tails of this from Minnesota's perspective. I, I just can't unless they're betting that this is the season that Eric Stahl hits his wall and is no longer productive hockey player which all right fine i mean he put up 19 goals and 47 points in a shortened season this past year so i i'm not betting on it um even if he regresses a little bit that's still probably going to be a superior superior player to what marcus johansson is right now i mean it's a great get for buffalo for a team that that really wants to turn it around now but yeah from minnesota standpoint i don't get it and there was another report that came out like just before recording that they're not going to be even talking to Alex Galchenyuk about a contract, which I think we all expected him to go to UFA, but they're not even going to talk. 
I don't know. I know Minnesota, we've been screaming for a while that there's they're stuck in um, purgatory and they need to, like, you can't just get good. So generally you have to rebuild. And, and I know that's been a popular opinion on this podcast is Minnesota needs to rebuild, but this isn't a rebuilding move. You're, you're swapping a $20 bill for a $10 bill. Like, I don't get it. There's no short-term or long-term gain on this move. It's only one year, right? Is that what you said? For both players, yeah. So it's not... I mean, it's a shake-up, I guess, but I wouldn't say it's in the right direction. I'd probably prefer to have Eric Stahl on and off the ice. Yeah, like, I love this move from Buffalo's standpoint, a team that has a lot of young talent. Again, we we overanalyze and overtout the veteran leadership crap all the time. But I mean, Eric Stahl has been there and done that at every level of hockey. So There's, if if you need yeah. a support ahead, system for Jack, yeah, sorry, if you need a support system for Jack Eichel to help bring the young guys along in Buffalo, Eric Stahl's a great guy to do it. And the the nice thing about bringing a guy like Eric Stahl for veteran leadership is he's still good. He's still going to put up his 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.75 points per game. He's still going to probably hit 20 goals. So, yeah. I think they're going to expect him to be the second line center. So, he's going to be up there around there whether he likes it or not. And, and that's fantastic for Buffalo because it takes yeah. the pressure off Eichel because everybody could game plan for Buffalo. Take out Eichel's line and, you're, and you've got them. As good as their wingers are, it's easier to shut down wingers. So... Now you could put Eichel between Reinhardt and Skinner, and then you have Stahl with Olofsson and, I don't know, Middlestap, Dylan Cousins, pick any one of their good prospects. And they all of a sudden have a very formidable top six that you'll have trouble game planning for. Because if you leave uh, Eric Stahl alone, he could pop off. If you leave Jack Eichel to your second pairing, he's going to torch you. So, I mean, Buffalo still got their problems on defense and in net, but hey, it's a hell of a good start. Yeah, I think the big win for this team, other than, you know, solidifying their middle a little bit, is it really does help the young players learn from someone who still has some game left. Like they Do they still have Kyle Ocposo in their salary? Yeah. So, I mean, like, that was probably what one of the hopes was for bringing him in, which was <laughs> not not good. Um, but you look to Eric Stahl, he can still play, and, you know, he's done everything, so... If it, at the absolute worst, this helps Buffalo get their shit together. Um, and I, I like this move a ton. Oh, my. You want it? Okay. So just as an aside, I'm, I'm just looking at Buffalo's cap friendly right now. Do you know how many forwards they have under contract for this upcoming season? Don't they have like $35 million in cap space? They have four forwards signed for this upcoming season as of right now, including Eric Stahl and Kyle Ocposo. It's two those two, Skinner Eichel. and Eichel. That's it. Oh my they God. have to sign everybody else. Camp will be uh, competitive. Yeah. Well, Kevin Adams will get his experience real fast. Jesus. Here's the thing. Uh, Bill Guerin, when asked about the deal, said this team, pretty much he said this team has been stagnant for a long time and we're not going to do anything other than stay stagnant if i don't make moves i'm making moves i'm changing this team and like all right broad strokes yeah i love that man like hell yeah go in there minnesota's done absolutely nothing of note since before time since their inception like i'm sorry that's just the case they've they've never taken minnesota the next step when is they were the close. vanilla of hockey they truly are they are plain rice cakes i like plain rice cakes it's weird that I like them, I know that, but I, I think they have utility, but I'm not going to think about them going to bed at night. They need to become some, I don't know, what's your favorite ice cream, Evan? Oh, I don't know. There's so <laughs> many. Your eyes just lit up. Wow, you love ice cream, huh? Yeah, typically when we go to the, we go to the driving range on Tuesdays and we get ice cream after, and I'm on a bit of a, uh, a search for the number one. I don't know what it is right now. I had an oh, apple... Well, I I had an apple cinnamon one the other night. That's not bad. It was good. A anyhow, they've never become... They're not apple, apple cinnamon. Cin they're not apple cinnamon. Great. That's awesome, Bill Guerin. Do your thing. But this just doesn't... It doesn't strike me as that. And then some people might say, oh, they're shedding salary. But they're not. 
And then some pe- and then you especially look at their signing of Jonas Brodin, which is, you know, I don't think a terrible contract, but it's a pretty rich one, considering who Jonas Brodin is and how old he is. It's just kind of a weird move. If it's a move for the sake of making a move, yeah, I, I, I've seen GMs do weirder things. Again, this isn't going to shatter the world, but like these guys have mentioned, Eric Stahl has utility. Eric Stahl does things on the ice that were not under the radar, but he was pretty underappreciated considering how much he did. He's going to do a lot for that Buffalo team, like they mentioned. So, yeah, if I'm a Minnesota Wild fan, I don't go to sleep crying tonight, but I'm sure confused about the direction my team's heading in. Their top four defense are making $27 million next year. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, Let's talk I, about that. Go I mean, ahead. it's not a bad top four. Uh, Spurgeon, Suter, Dumba, and Brodeen. That's a really, really good top four. I mean, I'm pretty sure Ryan Suter is like 62 years old now, and he's still got five years left on that contract. But wow. Yeah. It is wild how impactful those Parise and Suter contracts were. Get out. Did he switch it back to Parise? No. You did you mean that wild pun wasn't on purpose? Oh, no, it wasn't. <laughs> I don't know if I'm more or less disappointed in you because that was accidental. You should definitely be more. For <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Yo, okay, Jonas Brodin, that contract. I don't hate it. And I I can't believe I'm doing this because I told myself I'd avoid it to give to not give Evan the loaf hanging fruit. <laughs> but Jonas Brodin is one of the best defensive defensemen in the league. <laughs> Why is that, Ryan? How would you know? <laughs> Everyone get your bingo cards ready. This is what well, this number always comes up every week. I want to point out this is a funny bit if you're listening to this on iTunes or SoundCloud or whatever. But if you're watching on YouTube, you're howling right now <laughs> just because of Evan's <laughs> name <laughs> and has been his name the whole episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, the software that we use allows us to give ourselves screen screen names. And if we were like nice and considerate of our viewers and listeners, we'd make it our actual names, which we sometimes do. But today I'm uh, Evan's raffle ticket. Brad is desperately poor. And Evan is former defenseman Ryan. (laughs) Anyways, as a former defenseman. (laughs) Please tell tell us more, Ryan. (laughs) Maybe we'll make it Patreon. Maybe we'll make the concept of the defense Patreon exclusive. <laughs> Brodeen is a really, really good defensive defenseman. Do you pay a really, really good defensive defenseman that's already 27, 27 million years old? 27 years old, $6 million a year for seven more years. Uh, I, I don't. I think the cap hit's reasonable. Um, the terms maybe two years longer than I, I would be fully comfortable with. But I mean, you're never going to win 100% on a contract. So if you get a reasonable cap hit and you have to talk ta- tack on an extra two years, that's not the end of the world because it's not like he's going to go from a great defenseman to age 31, 32, and then all of a sudden be unplayable by 34. Yeah, he won't be as good, but he won't be that far off. And hopefully the world doesn't end again between now and then and the cap goes up. So Minnesota should do all right with this contract. I don't love it. I don't hate it. I think it's fair, if not a touch long. Yeah, I I agree. There's a full no move clause attached to it, I'm pretty sure, which is kind of, yeah. Well, Minnesota's the new Detroit for no move clauses. Oh man, just handing them out like crazy. Yeah, they have one, two, three, four, five, and three oh. of the five are on their defensive core. Oh. Mind you, <clears throat> their defensive core—it's on the the guys they've signed long term, good or bad, depending on how you you view though those things. The, the movement clauses is like is one of the, my biggest sticking points. Whenever I have. I never want them to be arguments, but people are, get pretty heated when I might make any kind of slant at Ken Holland, which I think we're still well in the window to be making slants at Ken Holland. Like, it's all fair game. I should also add that they have two modified no trade clauses in, well, Marcus Johansson <laughs> and uh, Devin Dubnik has a modified no trade clause as well. Oof. Eesh. 
I mean, who's trading for Devin Dubnik? He's got one uh, year left anyway, so it's oh, okay. whatever. When we when I talk about Ken Holland with people, a lot of people who, who are staunch advocates for him come to me right away and they say, oh, Ken Holland was only following ownership's direction. Like, he left this team in a great spot, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, yeah, okay, you know what? You're not wrong. Like, he did leave um, the team in a good spot by doing the right thing eventually and even if he did follow the the ownership's direction and trying to put off the rebuild no one was making him sign those contracts for that much money for that long and even if you want to argue that they did like the illich just said yeah i want abdul cater for a hundred thousand years and erickson for way too long no one made him add the no move clauses he had a jar in his office and it had some shitty jelly beans like black and white jelly beans and no movement clauses in there and everyone got a handful of everything wasn't it at one point you know the point of having a no trade clause was for your best players and the guys who've kind of earned it and you're like well yeah. we want you to be on this team forever and if you need that security we'll give you a no move trade or no trade clause not and then you've had six goals go in off your ass and you you used to hit people here you go. <laughs> Used to being the operative f- phrase there. Yep. One galaxy brain GM realized that players like certainty. So if you shaved like a half a million dollars off their cap hit, but added a no move, they do it. And they're like, we could use that cap space and then sign and or trade for a David leg one. And yeah. then it became the theme and then it backfired. And now nobody does it anymore except for Minnesota. And, like, for the record, I still maintain Ken Holland deserves a statue in front of the LCA one day. Like, he's the GM of one of the most successful franchises of all time, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to inundate you with that again. But it's still fair to criticize him. Like, even if the Illiches were 100% behind the extension of the the playoff streak at the expense of futures, he still made some pretty terrible mistakes that that put the team in the hole. And we're going to take that statue... We're going to pour a base of steel that is 100 feet deep, and then we're going to put the statue on top of it and weld it to the base so you can't move it. Yeah, because uh, maybe I'll get drunk one night and try to pull it down. It would, Yeah, of us three, it'd probably be me who'd get drunk and try to pull a Ken Holland statue down. I'd feel bad the next day because I advocated for it, but maybe me. <laughs> I, just, I would just think of the Erickson extension. I just... Uh, I tried to give the like the abdicator extension a chance way back. I remember that. I was like, uh, maybe the, uh, who knows? Maybe this works out. The Erickson one from the start. I was like, why? Jesus, why? Why us? Why? Anyhow, uh, that trade, that signing, Minnesota, they want to be something different. Is Matt Dumba on the move now? Does this mean Matt Dumba has to go? They're insane if they trade Matt Dumba at $6 million. But then again, if they need to trade a defenseman, Jared Spurgeon's 7.1 and Ryan Suter's infinity contract don't look much better. So if they're up the creek without a paddle, Dumba is the most likely to move. Is there something I don't know about Jared Spurgeon? Yeah, he's really good, but he's also got an infinity long contract as well, and he's 30 years old and a yeah, no yeah. move clause. He signed to 26 27, and it's 7 5 7 5 is the contract. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's code for we signed this guy too late. They really don't care how old their uh, players are when they sign them to max extensions, eh? This is the perfect example of a team that goes, we really like this player. We can't lose him, so we must sign him forever. Whereas the correct response of a player like Jared Spurgeon says, you're giving me seven by seven or I'm leaving. The correct response here is, okay, bye. I mean, there's those are the type of contracts that burn. Yeah, Jared Spurgeon's a great player right now and is absolutely going to live up to his seven mil a year for maybe two more years. Maybe. Well, it's going to be 37 at the end of this one, so like, might, not, might, might not be uh, cost effective. It's just crazy to think that they're going to have in the year 24-25 a 35-year-old Jared Spurgeon and a 40-year-old Ryan Suter taking up 15 million in cap space and if you want to tack Jonas Brodin on it it brings up brings it up to 21 million dollars and he'll be 32 oh my god does uh Minnesota have any 
high ranking prospects? Um, well, yeah, Kirill Kaprizov's coming over. He's not the youngest prospect in the world, but he's been viewed as the best player not playing in the NHL for the last few years. So that's a good sign for him that he's working his way over. Beyond that, though, no real names jump out to me other than Kalen Addison. Yeah, Alexander Hovanov had a big year in the queue, so maybe there's something there. Gerald Mayhew was the AHL Player of the Year. Maybe there's something there, but yeah, there's he's, not a lot there. Yeah, he's tw- Mayhew's 27, so I yeah. think his potential is realized at this point. Yeah. Speaking of teams in a rough shit. way. The Arizona Coyotes have essentially uh, Bill Armstrong was named their GM, by the way. Um, Arizona Coyotes, like we talked before about how things just went south for them really fast. It's pretty much been signaled that anyone age 25 and older is up for grabs on the team. Like they are selling everything. They have no hope of doing anything anytime soon. Phil Kessel, Derek Stepan, uh, Michael Grabner. Uh, Brad Richardson, who's a UFA, um, Henestroza, Ekman Larson, which is a huge one, Goligoski, uh, Hjalmarsson, uh, Jason Demers, and Jordan Osterley, and then Darcy Kemper and Antti Ranta. All of those guys you could, you could have. (sighs) Okay. So it's one thing to rebuild when you get stuck in this cycle of mediocrity. I could hear the argument for Arizona rebuilding, and I could hear the argument against it, looking at where they are as a team. I I could absolutely understand both sides of it. Here's the thing, though, about this. I get with the pandemic and the new ownership and wanting to cut costs. I get that. But in this upcoming draft in less than a month, the Arizona Coyotes do not have a first, second, or third round pick. And in the following draft in 2021, they do not have a first or third round pick. And if they re-sign Taylor Hall, that second round pick next year also disappears. But they get a Taylor Hall out of it, so that's a good trade. But still... Uh, this is going to be San Jose of this year, except no other team has their pick. It just vanishes. So for one thing, this is very beneficial for Detroit because if Arizona finishes behind them, hey, it, it literally bumps Detroit up a spot. So, and and honestly, there's if they get rid of a Kessel or a step on, if they get rid of Kemper, Yeah, they're going to be right down there with Detroit. Not maybe that bad, but they're going to be closer to the lottery than they are the playoffs. Here's here's something to bring up now. I think a lot of Red Wings fans are going to be looking at this and saying, oh, can the Red Wings get assets from them in exchange for taking on bad contracts? And I don't want to rule that out completely because Brad alluded to them being cash strapped, not in terms of salary cap, but in terms of ownership literally not being able to afford these players. Um so for the right price, they might be willing to do something silly hockey ops wise and send an asset to to get a high dollar contract out of there. That said, when you look at how they, they phrase this, like 25 and older, they're looking for assets back. And these aren't worthless players like uh, Michael Grabner or Derek Stepan. Both of those guys can be really, really useful to teams looking to just get that extra little bit of edge and competing for the cup. They'll probably get assets for those guys. Maybe not a lot, but they'll probably get assets. If you're looking at like a Phil Kessel and they don't want to pay his $6.8 million for the next two years and there's no buyers on that, that's where you might get into that territory. But you also have to think like we get a little bit like uh, our heads in the clouds on this. Like we get too obsessed with the fact that teams can't afford these players, but they're probably not going to give Detroit Phil Kessel for free, let alone give them things to take Phil Kessel. But none of this is a hard rule, right? Like we've seen it go both ways. If you're uh, Jim Rutherford, you're going to pay for guys who you could have had. It was the free spot on the bingo card, but you still paid for it. Or if you're, I don't know, another GM, you, you're you getting assets for a guy who realistically you should have been paying to give up. So it's not hard and fast, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't identify Arizona as like a target-rich environment for Detroit to get those 
quote unquote bad contracts and assets in return. Looking at this though, Arizona doesn't have many bad contracts. Their two worst contracts might be their second and third best players. Because Clayton Keller signed a 7.1 forever, but he's only 22. So even if he regresses even a little to the mean, that's probably a decent contract. Oliver Ekman Larson's making 8.2 for seven more seasons, and he's already 29. And then there's Nick Schmaltz atrocity of a contract, and nobody's taking that on in their right mind. So, But again, he's only 24, so there's still a hope that he bounces back. So Arizona's in the beneficial standpoint of they'll be able to move whoever they want. Schmaltz is probably the only unmovable contract on that entire roster. And the downside is it's so unmovable, nobody's going to take it. So, I mean, it, it's they're not in the worst situation to tear it down if they want to. It's just insane to me they're tearing it down right when they're going into the two drafts where they have no picks. Yeah, yeah, like if they don't want to spend money, then don't re-sign guys like Brad Richardson. Or you could, in theory, let Taylor Hall walk. Yeah, that would be, you know, not ideal because you'd probably like to have a Taylor Hall. But there's ways to save money without having to, you know, give up future assets to shed cap space or shed cap. Do you need full vulcanized rubber pucks? Why not a foam puck? You save three thousand dollars on pucks a year. That's just stonks right there. That's just big. That's big brain moves. Exactly. I mean, part of me goes, well, if you have no picks, you might as well restock as many as you can. And there is definitely logic to that. But I don't know, man. This fan base has suffered so much, and they're barely staying in Arizona as it is. Can you imagine if they have to go on another half decade of losing? Like, yeah, th- this is a tough one because objectively the benefits of rebuilding are are there but you have to get through the rebuild and arizona seems to be going in and out of rebuilds now for a decade it doesn't have to be a long one but it's just the pandemic this is the what the pandemic does the fringe teams who can't afford to operate at the uh, a high level of hockey ops it screws them they don't like brad said they don't have half bad players they were a, a almost they were a playoff team this year I don't know. That sucks. Yeah. I don't know why. I mean, technically, is the most is the best kind of correct. Yeah. So, I I don't know. I just I just feel bad for Arizona fans because I don't I don't see a good reality here for them at all, like at all. And obviously, if they're shedding dollars, they're not one of the teams in position to take on back contracts to get more assets. So they're going to have to give away good players to get assets. And they don't have a first round pick the next two years, which is the easiest way to turn around a rebuild. So if they do sell off your Phil, their Phil, Ke- even just Phil Kessel and Derek Stepan, man, they're a bottom 10 team unless Darcy Kemper absolutely stands on his head again. But he's on the block. Now yeah. he will fetch them good assets in normal times. But there's so many goalies out there, even if Kemper's the best of them. Is a team really going to give up that much for him? They're like, well, yeah, we could get Darcy Kemper for a first and a second. That's great. But we can sign Braden Holpe for three years and give up zero assets. Most teams are going to go for the one where they have to give up zero assets. So I don't know. I This is just an all-around no-win situation for Arizona. Before I transition us to our prospect profile, I have a somber announcement. I got got by a fake NHL account. I quickly popped into Twitter. Um, I got a notification because someone has sent me the uh, a tweet from the Montreal Canadiens that said Joel Edmondson would be wearing the number sixty nine. And so from the podcast account, I quote tweeted and I said, "Your time to shine, Evan." And I tagged Evan. And then afterwards, yeah, afterwards, Evan was like, "It's fake," and I was like, "Wow." Besides the fact that I got got by a fake account, which whatever happens to the who among us. You know, but the fact that Joel Edmondson won't be wearing the number 69, I just, it was dangled in front of me and then it was taken away. So that's my night ruined. Uh, anyhow. Hey, well, if it makes you feel any better, just remember that the Montreal Canadiens just signed a number six defenseman for four years at three and a half million and just Carl Alsner themselves all over again. So, hey, division rivals making bad moves. Always fun. 
Uh, Mark Bridgman, another GM that I don't often understand or agree with. But hey, they beat the Penguins. Prospect profiles. This is going to be a fun one because it's going to be a little bit of a pipe dream for Red Wings fans, but it's still within the realm of possibility uh, of our prospect profiles um, that we're covering for potential fourth overall picks for the Detroit Red Wings. This one is we're only doing players who could possibly happen, so we're not going to do an in-depth one on Alexi Lafreniere. It's just not going to shake out that way. This one is probably on the farthest fringe of, yeah, this likely won't happen. But it still falls within it, so we're still going to do it. And it is none other than big centerman uh, from Sudbury in the OHL, Quinton Byfield. Brad, start with the hopes and dreams. The hopes and dreams that there is not a strong chance, but a reality where Quinton Byfield is the best player to come out of this draft. Not putting my money in that basket, but when you are the size of Quinton Byfield, can skate the way Quinton Byfield can skate, when you have the skill that Quinton Byfield possesses, he has every tool in the toolbox to be an elite, elite, elite player. That's the upside. The downside is he hasn't quite been that to expectation yet now he did have a huge year 82 points in in 45 games in the ohl which is remarkable but that is about the same pretty close to the same points per game as cole perfetti for whatever that's worth and perfetti had a better rookie year again take that for what it's worth different players different styles and byfield did have an injury this year um great hockey iq makes the simple plays but and, and oh i forgot to mention the biggest thing in relation to the Red Wings possibly picking by Phil up fourth overall, he fills their biggest need. He would be their first or second line center in all likelihood for a very long time. Out of the top three potential picks in this draft, Byfield's also the highest likelihood to bust because of what his perceived weaknesses are, which is his lack of creativity and um how do I phrase this? The concern that his physical size and tools help him dominate at a lower level, but his brain won't keep up at a higher level, which is possible. I'm not betting on that. There's a reason I still have him number two on my draft on my list, but there is legit reason to be concerned there just in case, just like we're concerned about Perfetti skating, just like we're concerned about Rossi's size, just like we're concerned about Drysdale's off like offensive upside. There, there's always concerns. But the tools with Byfield, and I know we've used that term to death with him this year, are there. You can't deny it. They are there. And if he puts them all together, he's the number one franchise center for a very long time. Yeah, this is one of those rare drafts where I think you can look at both of those top players and say, yeah, both of these guys are going to be or are worthy of the number one overall pick. And that's just the impression I get with Byfield. Like Brad nailed it. Like this is a guy who has every single tool in the toolbox that you would want talent wise. Um, his drawbacks are probably overscouted at this point. Like Quentin Byfield has been talked about and on the radar for a long, long time. And this is kind of a known phenomenon where when the players kind of in front of people's eyes and scouts eyes for that long, they tend to pick at identify and inflate, any flaws to the nth degree we probably are doing it right now with cole perfetti for example like it's just what happens with overexposure so i don't buy too much into quentin byfield's drawbacks i think yeah he's not lighting the world on fire quite yet but if he was then we'd be talking about him first overall over lafreniere there is a world where he's the best player out of this draft or there is a world where lafreniere is the best player out of this draft and quentin byfield's by far the the next best player out of like this draft in the next five drafts right like it's not this is any team picking second overall. This is their dream. A six foot four centerman who does everything and skates well. Like, are you kidding? And the fact that there's even discussion of this guy falling to Detroit is what A, blows my mind, and B, reminds me that we're living in a stupid 2020 simulation. I'm just going to put this out there now. I think there's a less than 1% chance of it happening. I don't think it's quite likely at all. I think of the two of the, the, you know, cemented top three, which is Lafreniere, Byfield, and Stutzla. I think Stutzla is way more liable to fall to number four. But I guess it is possible. 
if Drysdale goes second and then Ottawa's in love with Lucas, Lucas Raymond or they really, you know, let's get absolutely batty here. They're upset that they don't get Drysdale, so they take Sanderson, knowing that they'll get Raymond or Rossi fifth. There's one way. Again, that sounded stupid. You probably rolled your eyes and said, what's this jackass talking about? Still. I'm I'm gonna pretend like I was gonna pretend like this was gonna be a natural transition back in. I lost connection and so this is gonna take a lot of editing. But still, my point is Byfield is the best case scenario if you're picking not first overall, and he's gonna make some team really happy. And if it's the Detroit Red Wings, I will strip and run for as long as I can. That's as, that's my analysis. Evan frowned because he doesn't like the image or is curious about it um i just don't even know what else to add like you just you can't teach size and i've been lucky enough to see quint byfield play a few times this past season and he didn't like the world on fire to me but he ended up with five points in the game that's how good he is he skates unbelievable not just for a guy who's huge but compared to everyone else in the draft like for me, he's the total package, and I would be shocked if someone took Lef- him over Lafreniere, but I could understand why they would do it because it's that intriguing. Uh, I think the sky's the limit for him, but it also might be a slightly risky pick because you don't know what you totally have with him because it's sort of the the big guy dominating the younger kids kind of thing. You know, if he was maybe two inches shorter, we wouldn't be having this conversation, which is kind of funny to me but i i've seen him play twice i know that's a a small sample sample size but i i thought he was incredible and i didn't even think he was that entertaining to watch it's it's a good problem to have when you're watching quentin byfield and at times it looks like the ohl is almost too easy for him because he is so much bigger and faster and skilled than everybody else and and the only risk that comes in with that is you can go, okay, well, how much more room is there to grow in his game? Because if you feel like he's only going to get a little bit bigger and his skating is what it is, yeah, there's a reason to believe that he'll translate to the next level. And, and he's already good enough to play at the next level, but he might not dominate at the next level. And, and you can see that argument. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time a real big guy got drafted high and then just it did not translate when everybody else around him turned out to be as big and as strong as he was but again that's not byfield's game he's not a physical player for how big he is obviously he'll have to change that when he gets to the nhl most players do but yeah it's the the thing is that really leaves me wanting with how good he is is we don't get to see his creativity in the ohl because he doesn't need it i want to see what Quinton Byfield can do when he's put in a truly bad position on the ice, when the chips are stacked against him, when he's in double coverage with no outlets, when, you know, they're running a hard cycle and he's got the monster defenseman on him. Like what is his creative way to get out of it? Because his way out of it now is just to skate and push his way through. It's not hard for him in a lot of those circumstances. So yeah, I, I would like to see more creativity in his game, but just because he's so good, we're not going to see it until he jumps up. Yeah, and he's very lucky to be gifted with an uh, incredible lev- level of athleticism and just absolute talent that I don't really have any concerns with him improving that at the next level. Like, I think he could potentially, probably with the teams that are drafting second third overall he'll jump onto their roster next year unless they're trying to control the lcs blah 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 for just looking at a pure talent standpoint he could be a number two center next year i think he would be detroit's number two center next year <laughs> hands down they wouldn't oh. do it because that's not you don't do that but you will yeah yeah you know if you're just looking at a depth chart and you aren't you know playing chess you're just trying to slot guys in he would be. He might even be the number one center if that wasn't a slight against uh, Dylan Larkin. I I said this when we still had that stupid, feeble hope of Detroit winning the draft lottery. I I always said I would be pretty much just as happy if Detroit got 
second overall is first. And not because I always view second overall as valuable, but because of what Quentin Byfield is. Brad, you called him a risk. I think he's like, shit, if, if, if Byfield's a risk, teams shouldn't even show up. Well, okay, it, it's a risk of... Is he going to be a number one center in the NHL? Because, again, with his skill set, he, he's going to play. He could play in the NHL right now, possibly. Um, but is it going to be as a third-line center or is it a first-line center? That's the only question to me with Byfield is how high in the lineup and how high in the league rankings does he get? Is he a top 10 center? Is he a top 30 center? Is he a second-line center? That's – I don't know. I, I really don't know, and I – I think the the window for what he could be as an NHLer is pretty big just because there's a lot about him we don't know and we can't really know yet, which sucks. And it's it's rare to be stuck in this circumstance with a player like this because, again, we we know what a Cole Perfetti can do when the chips are against him because the dude's a five foot ten guy who can't skate. The guy the chips are always against him. So it's it's weird i don't even know how to properly evaluate this guy uh you just pissed off a lot of perfetti stands with that i usually ask the question of how likely or not how likely is uh, or how happy would you be i think it's safe to say quentin byfield is second on all of our rankings behind uh, lafreniere yep yeah, yeah i've i've flirted with dropping him down but never actually done it uh, so I won't say, you know, how happy would you be? Cause it, we'd be thrilled. Like Detroit won the lottery likelihood. Am I being too much of a pessimist by saying less than a percent? Uh, yeah, yeah I'd say 2%. Ooh, something. Cr- yeah, it's du- what'd you say, Ryan? Less than 1%, right? Brad said, dude, that's double. That's twice yeah. as likely. Well, yeah, I'll say 3%. Oh my oh, goodness. Getting oh, wild. He's a $1 Bob. I mean, if LA is as hot to trot on Stutzla as everybody says, then it just takes Ottawa to like one guy just a little more. And here we are. All right. Well, if Quentin Byfield comes to uh, comes to be for the Red Wings, you won't find happier podcast hosts anywhere. So let's hope that LA does something dumb and then Ottawa does something dumb. And then we, we reap the benefits. And then you just know, like, Jamie Drysdale is going to be the next Quinn Hughes, and we're not going to hear the end of it. But whatever. That's uh, Quinn Byfield, and I'm sorry if this was a tease for Red Wings fans, but, hey, it's within the realm of possibility. We didn't do one for Lafreniere, so there's that. All right. Um, Overtime. I think it's probably time for overtime now, lest this internet cut out again. This is a true midweek episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, so we are going to start off with, or sorry, only do uh, Patreon comments. Uh, midweek overtimes are Patreon exclusive, as always, saying thank you to everyone who supports the show. Uh, Jake Nagy says, less than three weeks until the draft. Seems like we've been waiting an eternity. It also means you guys are three weeks away from starting your 2021 coverage, right? Still a long way out, but do you have a preferred defensive partner from that class to pair with our German son, Mo Sider? Owen Power playing at Michigan seems like a dream target for many Wings fans, but how about that giant Swede Edvinson or Brent Clark? Cheers, boys. Um, I don't know if I would say ideal defense partner because he also shoots right, but I the more I watch of Brent Clark, oh man, there is something special there. Edvinson's the wild card because he's like six foot five and can skate and has offense, so he he'll be the real wild card of this draft. Um. But yeah, Brent Clark just lit the world on fire the second half of last season. And, and and that half of the season, he was a point per game player as a 16-year-old defenseman. Yeah. That's it. That's insane in the OHL. Uh Haroon Khan says, Hey guys, long time, no comment. What do you think about f- one Ethan Bear in a 14th and 14th overall and a third or second round pick for the fourth overall pick? I saw that. Good God, no. <laughs> 2021 third for Josh Anderson. Yes. Columbus wouldn't take that. No, Columbus wouldn't even consider that. Bobby Ryan for Abdulkader. Yes, please. 
Yeah, I don't know what's taking that. Uh, thanks, guys, and let's go Red Wings. Denny OD says, hello, guys. Uh, I am interested to hear your thoughts on Brodeen's contract. You've already probably talked about it. But seven years for $6 million, uh, is quite a lot for a middle-of-the-road 27-year-old defenseman, in my opinion. Confused on what the Wild are doing. Update, they just traded Stahl for Johansson. I repeat, I'm very confused on what the Wild are doing in general. Yeah, that was pretty much our segment. Uh, Quaz says, so I can buy a project boat for a thousand dollars. My boat works wonderfully. I could potentially make three to four thousand dollars selling that. What should I do? Evan, what did I just hear? A boat? Yeah, I know nothing about uh, Evan's about point boats. dumb. Um, you should sell your boat, buy the project boat, fix that up, and sell that boat, and then buy the nicest boat you can with your earnings. There you go. Yeah. The towering behemoth Leviathan says, so with Brodine signed by the wild, how many weeks of Doomba for Nylander will we suffer now? I mean, it was going to happen regardless. (laughs) Um, Oh, that trade almost makes too much sense, though. Lonnie Zone says, your conversation last time made me wonder what would happen if we got Krug and Chara. A lot of money, but they would help with Hironic and Sider's development, I feel, and bringing leadership and quality play to the back end and a little winning swagger to the room in general. Okay, really, I'm just bracing for the train wreck season we're about to have. Thanks for letting me dream. Keep up the great work, fellas. Hey, I'd be all for it. Just bring both those Boston guys over. Yeah, like I don't care about timelines or rebuilds or anything. It would just be fun to watch. and We haven't had happy things in a while. Watching Boston fans meltdown over losing Char and Krug to the Red Wings would be worth the back half of Tory Krug's contract being as bad as it'll be. Who would you rather have right now? Cider or Byram? Byram. Yeah, not a popular answer, but (laughs) probably Byram. I think Cider made it a lot closer, but I I still go Byram there. Zadina or Zegris? Zadina. Yes, I think that's still Zadina. I'm still like, I'm still just as thrilled with him as a pick. Turcotte or Cousins? Turcotte. Um, I'm, I'm still Turcotte. I'm still not as nearly as high on Cousins as everybody else. Uh, Lafreniere or Jack Hughes? Lafreniere. Yeah. Uh, Kako or Byfield? Oh, that one. Byfield. I'm going Byfield. I'm going balls to the wall. Yeah, yeah, I'm going by field too. Kako or Stutzla? Man, what he, one season does, eh? Yeah, Man, yeah, I know. Stutzla. I'd probably, I probably give this to Kako. I'm not going to hold that against him. I'm going to go with Kako too. It's hard to play your first year in the NHL. Sup, hockey, hockey amigos. What's your favorite non wings playoff OT goal? Mine is probably either Stefan uh, Matteau, Game 7 to send Rangers over New Jersey Devils to the finals in 94, or Burroughs, Game 7. That's mine. Burroughs, Game 7 goal to help Vancouver finally beat Chicago in like 2011 during peak Hawkstum. Sticks on the ice, boys. Let's go Red Wings. I love that Burroughs goal. Oh, man. that Well, I love the reaction of that Burroughs goal. That was, that was chaos. Um, I'm always a sucker for watching highlights of when it, when an OT goal is scored to win the cup. And I, I don't like the devil. So Jason Arnitz isn't mine. Alec Martinez against the Rangers was pretty damn cool to watch live. Um, I mean, it sucks that it was Lundqvist that he had to score it on, but that was, that was pretty spectacular to see. Um, yeah. I don't have any other like mega crazy ones that are, jo- Oh, I know. So that'll be my recent one if we're going old school. Uh, Beret against the Flames game seven back in 93 or 94, I believe it was. We got to get you a Pavel Bure jersey one day. I have one. Yeah, of course you do. It's autographed. <sighs> Evan. <laughs> Evan, do you have any? I'll just say the Brett Hall one, not because it was uh, anything special, but because it was such a... Icon. moment in hockey history yeah it's a seminal moment 
Sean Chavarella says, hey guys, sadly Pierre Maguire didn't get the job in Arizona. Maybe good for Arizona, but bad for Team Chaos. Looking pretty bad for the Yotes. Lost Chica, Chica, I don't know. Lost their picks. COVID hurts the owners. They have one pick in the first three rounds for the next two years, so no help is on the way. Is Bill Armstrong put in a position to fail? We will see. Will we see the end of Arizona? Honestly, honestly, maybe. If if there was no COVID, I would say no, the, the, the NHL will push them through. But because of COVID, we might have to see Arizona be sold. Ugh. I mean, how quickly is this new owner going to get rid of them, though? I don't think he's going to abandon ship in a year or two. I don't know if uh, a rich guy from Quebec City says, hey, here's a truckload of money that you're not making owning this team right now. I don't know what a dude from Quebec City is going to do with a team in Houston, but sure. <laughs> Uh, Eric Schrader says, with all the talk about Cole Perfetti floating around and being linked to Detroit, is there a chance that it's a misinformation campaign by Stevie to make sure Ottawa feels comfortable not taking Drysdale at three? He's notoriously tight lipped, so it seems odd to me that there's so many links. Oh yeah. It's I don't I don't trust anything. Like I mean I'll roll with it because we have no better information, but I don't trust it at all. Yeah. I don't know about a misinformation campaign. I think that's a little bit too, that's too many loops. That's too many loop to loops for Steve Eisenman's liking. He seems like a no bullshit kind of guy, but uh, I agree that it, it, I wouldn't draw those lines too thick right now. Uh, John Evans says, hello, gents. Greetings, greetings from Ohio. Again, my condolences, John. Uh, I heard Elliot Friedman suggest Chara to the wings on 31 thoughts. Crazy or no? Talked about it last episode. Not crazy. And I think we all actually like the idea. Weird, well, weird as it is yeah evan didn't really say much during that segment but i just took that as tacit agreement i like zdeno chara and i like him as a person as well so why not he's very long did you guys know that <laughs> <laughs> no no comment joseph fornia says hey there fellas my younger brother has boldly stated <clears throat> that tyler bertuzzi is the most talented player on the red wings roster despite my arguments otherwise please discuss okay so two theories here one your younger brother is tyler bertuzzi two your younger brother is two years old those are the I, options i can't even formulate a good devil's advocate argument for that being true <laughs> Uh, by the way, Perfetti reportedly going in for his third interview with Steve Eiserman. How many interviews before the draft is normal? Oh, it's hard to say because before the interviews would be at the combine primarily. So they'd sit, take the kid in a room for an hour and, and meet with him face to face in the pandemic world with zoom being prevalent. You could, I don't know if three is normal. They teams could have had six interviews with some of these players for all we know. Um, three feels like the appropriate number for me. So I would hope they've had at least three interviews with everybody ranked 10 or higher at this point, but I don't know. I'd be willing to bet all of my dollars, which isn't a lot of them that they've had as many interviews with Perfetti as they have with Rossi, with Drysdale, with Raymond, with probably Byfield as well. They, they probably did with, with Lafreniere just for shits. Like, he, he, three is definitely indicates that it's a strong likelihood that he's picked, but not just him. It's anyone within that range. They're not going to not do their due diligence. Chris Draper is, like, meticulous with this. I uh, can't put too much stock in the NHL awards, no matter how fun they are to watch. After all, can they really be taken seriously after Jim Carrey barely won the Vesna over Chris Osgood in 96? Osgood for Hall of Fame. Stay fresh, cheese bags. Scott Garland says, hey, boys, first time writing in, and I'm sure it won't be the last new Patreon subscriber, and I'm excited to be giving back to such an awesome podcast. Scott, thank you so much for your support, man. That means a lot to us, and welcome to the Dub Dub family. Uh, he says, I have a simple question for you that I always find fascinating and parting part of my ignorance. If you have ever talked about this before, are there any hockey players from your hometown or close by? I'm from Baldwinville, New York, and grew up around the corner from Alex Tuck, who's in Vegas, and Tim Con Connolly, Islanders and Sabres, and a stone's throw from Joel Farabee, who plays for the Flyers, and Boo Neves or the, for the Rangers. Here's a funny story about Alex Tuck. I'm 31 now, and I remember playing roller hockey with him when he was like 10 years old, and my brother checked him on accident, and he flew to the ground and scraped his knees. He ran home crying, and I still think to this day that my brother only aided in his hockey development. Also, huge shout out to my brother, Mike Garland, for getting me into the show. And of course, the Red Wings cheers from Scott Garland. Mike, your good brother. 
Uh, that's an awesome story. We're in and around Kitchener-Waterloo right now, and there are a ton of NHL players. So many. Mark Shifley, Mike Hoffman, Tanner Pearson, Nick Hag, Scott Stevens, if you want to go back a little bit, Kevin Klein. Landis Cog. Well, Darryl he played the Kitchener Rangers, but <laughs> yeah, Scott Darryl Steven, Sittler. Mild Schmidt. Uh, yep. la, 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 the Kraut line. The mo- arguably the most famous line in hockey history, all three of them were from Kitchener-Waterloo. That's why they were called the Kraut line, because this was a German-founded community. Kyle is- Quincy. Yep. Kyle Quincy. Tanner <laughs> Pearson. Uh, Kevin Klein is a more recent one as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's quite a lot. That's all I got. I'm, I'm from Windsor, and there's even more from there. Windsor's kind of like a like a lot of times you'll see guys listed as Toronto, and they're not really from Toronto. They're from like the Greater Toronto area, or like an hour away, and they just got lazy. They do kind of the same thing with Windsor. If you're anywhere south of London, you're from Windsor, according to the NHL. Pretty much. Um, lifelong Stars fan, Brad. <laughs> Brad, are you ready for this one? I'm going to probably not listen. Go when you're ready. Good day, dud duds. Time for me. Rob Cop Show to celebrate my beloved, my beloved Pony D's making the Ice Hockey Super Bowl. It's been a long journey this season from the CEO calling Ben and Sagan heck and horse heck being one of the lowest scoring teams in the regular season, which was an excellent tactic to save all the goals for the playoffs to the repeated comebacks when it mattered most. Anyway, I'm so happy for me. Pretty annoyed the Dud Dud account hasn't changed their avatar to the magnificent finger guns photo of me resplendent in my old school stars jersey, you cowards. That picture of you, Brad, I understand the context to it. Brad did a lot of work with Upper Deck back in the day, and they'd have like corny videos and stuff. And that's why the Brad has pictures with like Connor McDavid and stuff like that. But none of that makes it through. The only thing is Brad with the very 1999 haircut where guys didn't know what to do with their hair besides just like push it down and spread it out a bit with a, the ugliest Dallas stars jersey in existence, giving the double finger gun. That is, did Crystal not see that photo before she said yes to marrying you? I, oh, she was already dating me at that point. And I, not to encourage people to go look them. That is far from the worst thing I've, I've done with upper deck. So <laughs> that sounds sultry. Is there it, a calendar? Uh, somewhere we don't know about couple. <laughs> don't, oh, well, <laughs> Patreon giveaway. Uh, since it was raised above, the hockey writers is an absolute oh wow is an absolute garbage blog, and they should be ignored. I skimmed their latest piece of brain diarrhea, and I honestly felt dumber for having looked at it. Can we please have a moratorium on nonsense articles being raised and leave it to the hellscape that is the Wings Reddit page? Obviously, my nonsense is allowed. Jersey time, best pointy D's jersey in their franchise history. North stars don't count. Damn it. Oh, North star. Okay. So it's it's the cop out answer, but their first jerseys when they came over to Dallas, as much as I liked the green ones with the star decal on the bottom, just their OG black and white ones with the green trim were beautiful. I, I'm I'm admittedly biased because when I was growing up playing minor hockey, those were the jerseys we wore. We literally followed the stars. So I had the North Stars jerseys for a few years, then those, then the green ones. But yeah, those those black and white ones, the green trim were perfect. When they came out with the um, star shape in the jersey, like that goes across her whole body with like the main one being the green and black. That is my favorite. Although honorable mention to the full winter classic uniform, their ST Deers jersey. <laughs> I that with the cream pants. I don't know, man. That was a good look for me. Oh man, the ST Deers with the cream pants. I just, I can't, I can't right now. Come on, uh, man! You had to have done that one on purpose. I honestly, Brad, I swear to you, I ha- I didn't. Oh. I'm too sh- I'm, I'm honestly too shaken by the accusation that I pre-write my lines on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I cannot. I can't have prep for anything. This show. It was in my. It was in my head the whole day. And that I'm not mad. I'm not angry. Like it's a good piece of feedback. I'm. T- I probably sounded monotonous and I'm corny. Like I genuinely appreciated the feedback, but just the notion. That twice a week, in addition to everything we do in the show, I'm writing my lines. Oh, man, <laughs> we have full-time jobs. I swear to you. I can't. It's tearing me apart. Um, anyhow, uh, when Lisa, you see... Cle- you're tearing me apart. 
<laughs> when you see Cleet Blakeman is a ref for the Lions versus uh, the team from Green Bay game again this week, use the Stay Fresh cheese bags to tie over his head and abduct him to give the Lions a fair chance. Stay Fresh cheese bags, the classy abductor's choice in a Fournier company. Man, the Lions. You know how many people have texted me saying, what the hell happened to the Lions? And I say, have you not been paying attention for the last however long you've been alive? Nick Putty says, hey, guys, any word on whether they're using the EPUC in the playoffs like they had mentioned pre- uh, pre-COVID? I remember this being a hot topic midseason that it'd be introduced in the playoffs and there wasn't much discussed about it since. No, they're not doing it. It's pushed back again. They've done some stuff, though. Like, there's now tracking data, like, during the broadcast. So they've implemented something at this point because it'll show. I forget one of the Dallas uh, Vegas games when Martinez had that one timer that went in, they showed like the velocity on the puck going into the net. So they're doing something new. Unless they are doing it, but I haven't heard anything about it. I feel like it would have been a bigger deal. Yeah, you'd think so. A lot going Uh, on in the world these days though, Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. Joe D'Elia says, what's good, my dudes? Oh, the Twitter comments. Called a guy big brain for suggesting Larkin for Dumba straight up. Yeah, that is. That's galaxy brain. Should I feel bad or did he deserve it? He deserved it. Uh, anyways, let's get toxic. I'm going to give you five fan bases. Order them from big brain to galaxy brain. Detroit, Toronto, Boston, Vancouver, and Montreal. Maybe for Sunday we'll do the same, but just for toxic fan bases. Thanks, guys. So are we doing like for the, the fan bases that come up with the most bullshit trade request or are we talking about just like shitty awful fan bases no 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 like you like big brain galaxy brain like that's more like trade requests like they're they're okay just- toronto takes the first second and third spots uh then montreal then vancouver then boston i'm gonna say okay for in order from galaxy brain to big brain which is like from worst to like most stupid proposals back i'm gonna go montreal then toronto Toronto, then, that it was a meme for years that any free agent that was half decent was going to Toronto, that any decent player who went on the trade block was going to Toronto. It was a meme forever. Mantha for Domi, Mantha for, you know, Alsner, Mantha for Bergevin. I, I'll go, yeah, fine. Toronto and or Montreal. And then I'll probably say Vancouver, Detroit, then Boston. Sure, I could live with that. I can't give us the credit. We honestly might be worse than Vancouver, but it's not my job to recognize that. Uh, Phil Philip Gastineau says, trading for Flurry is a Ken Holland move. If I've ever heard one, that is all. <laughs> I mean, if he wasn't taking, um, uh, what's it called? Jimmy Howard. Yeah, Maybe. that's a problem. Can you take both and still have Koskinen? Remember when uh, they signed Koskinen the yeah. day before they fired Shirelli? Wasn't that just... Some mess. The NHL is so funny. Like these teams are sometimes you're like these teams are hanging on by a thread, like mentally, right? Like they're they're not all there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this next comment is from Ben Shapiro reading WAP for an hour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> says at least it's not Babcock. Not super excited about uh, Laviolette. He seems to have the personality of a wet napkin. But anything is better than that douche canoe Babcock. Uh, <laughs> oh my god that is the greatest patreon name we've ever had <laughs> just your average teach says so we live in a strange universe where my childhood favorite team is playing brad's team and then team my buddies are trying to get me to root for are playing ryan's team and now for golf guy talk best ways to work on your putts in the house shot a 95 today but had 43 putts that's not a good day oh that hurts <laughs> that's really bad how do you work um, on your putt in the house anywhere you can literally putt anywhere. Get a what putting do you get, mat. Just like a heavy mug, and then I just usually putt towards my door. Hmm. And then wherever it hits, you're like, yeah, that would have been the hole. I get it to like try to get it so it just barely touches the door, or just barely before it. And if I hear that it hit the door, then I know it was too long. That Every... also is a bad habit, but it's what I got. Every three days, a uh, uh, cat comes into his room and uh pour some pop or soda whatever you i don't know in michigan they say pop oh, we say pop here too it's weird when people call it soda i think anyway she pours some pop on the ground to make some parts of the floor sticky to simulate like different greens it's true we try to yeah. you know build up the amount of mold under the carpet so that it oh, yeah. you know it, it we got Bumps. some break on the on the carpet yeah 
Uh, all right, we're going to wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you who support us, who listen, who offer feedback, who who are Patreon supporters, rate us on iTunes. Thank you all so much. Our name-level Patreon sponsors, these are the heart and soul of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Terry, Greach, Arjun Shanker, Jeremiah Dobo, Jake Kiefer, Ben Shapiro reading WAP for an hour. Andrew Bohan, Scott Martin, Jacob Turner, Matt McKay, Craig Kibble, Brandon M., Matthew M. Rice, Luke Johnson, Kaylin Wood, Hassam al Charlie Elkins, Hana Lee, Obir Juan Kenobi, Trevor Pevavar, Alex Ott, Ashley Van Conant, Chris Frank, Connor Leighton, Matthew Keeler, Simon Anderson, Antonio Gracias, John Evans, Quaz, and Stan Olson. Thank you all so much. I got to end this before Brad dies of giggling. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.